Hey, guess what? I got a giveaway for you again, but real quick, before I tell you what the free program is today, I have a statement to make. One of the best cartoons of the 80s was G.I. Joe. Okay, there I, there I said it. I'm done. Don't argue with me because I know I'm right. All right, here's the giveaway for today. The Prime Bundle. This is Maps Prime and Maps Prime Pro. Mobility, connection, correctional exercise focused programs. Here's how you can win both of them. This is what you got to do. Leave a comment the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. Do all those things. And if we like your comment, we'll notify you. You'll get free access to both programs. Also, we're running a sale, 50% off sale on two very popular workout programs. So there's MAPS Performance, Train Like an Athlete, Look Like an Athlete. That's the first program. The second one is MAPS Aesthetic, Train Like a Bodybuilder, Look Like a Bodybuilder. So it's aesthetic fo focused versus performance focused. Okay, so what kind of person are you? Who knows? You're one of the other, one or the other, or maybe you're both. Doesn't matter. They're both 50% off right now. If you want MAPS performance, go to mapsgreen.com. If you want MAPS aesthetic, go to mapsblack.com. But for both of them, for the 50% off, you have to use the code FEB50 for that 50% off discount. All right, here comes the show. So what have you been up to? We haven't, like, I, I was on your show recently, but we really we didn't yeah. get a chance to talk about you too much and what your business has been up to and what you've been up to and you obviously look healthy you always look real healthy thanks uh, man what, what's going on is this for recorded podcast or is this this just is bro catch up oh i see you're gonna you you want to you want to there's a stuff you can tell the audience and stuff you can't tell the audience. <laughs> no 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 it's just you know if you're recording you know there's like a, it's like a, this is what i'm doing yeah. you know yeah. you, don't sound, you don't want to sound cocky where you're like oh, more... pretty much fucking crushing life since you asked adam uh, yeah. yeah exactly <laughs> no, we're, people are listening we're, this all is, the facade this is for the podcast but yeah let us know what you've been up to man <sighs> well i mean i, I think the obviously the last year been working on the book, which is really exciting. Um, and, uh, transitioned to Austin, Texas, which is exciting. So that's been kind of went through like a whole phase of slowly, gradually working my way into even like a, a higher level of minimalism than was before, uh, as you know, preparation to transition to, to, to leave LA and move to Austin. So tell me, wait a so second, been, I'll, really expand cool. on that. Cause you're a good person to expand on this. Yeah, so, what you do you mean by like, you're in that you're in a transition of, minimalism while you're also scaling and probably becoming more and more successful. So talk to me about what that's like. Yeah. Well, so minimizing material stuff and really just kind of doing an examination or an audit of each of the things that I have in my life. And that includes components in the business and people involved in the business and um, offerings within the business. Um, you know, and, and so things that were not actually bringing, uh, you know, like Proto's principle, what are the 20, 20 percent of things that are providing 80 percent of the value you know the things that were not actually providing that value from both a material like stuff perspective and also uh, from a, a, a like a courses and programs that we're offering perspective just cutting out the superfluous stuff to to have more focus on the few things that I actually value and moving is such a beautiful way to do that because you know you're forced to fit everything into a handful of boxes and transition to a new place um, you know, and so that's, that's been, that's been the thing. It's been like, anything, I, almost like forcing myself to do that. Anything, uh, that you were reluctant to let go of, or that you have found a little challenging. I, I, I wrestle with this thing all the time. Like, ah, oh, should I cut back on some of these things? I was always like, I want to fire everyone. And I'm like, no, I don't think we should. <laughs> no, really though. Like, uh, were there <laughs> things in your life shoes. that you, you felt were, you know, you were wasting money on, or you had, and you didn't need, uh, that you decided to cut out and were, were, were there anything? Things that you struggled with letting go of? Mm, no, not so. I find I find letting go of stuff incredibly gratifying. So there is not a lot of tip, tip. I'm actually on the other end where I'm eager to let go of stuff. Mm. Okay. You know, so there ha there hasn't. So when uh, I think it's something that's invaluable coming from a, a a business lens specifically, or really any lens, is having an outside outside eyes on what you're doing. You know, so for us, I've had we we just recently hired a couple a couple new people that are, you know, they're just really excellent with systems and marketing and organization and you know funnels and offerings and all of that. And you know, those are things that I'm not good with. You know, like I, I'm I'm better with being creative and connecting and community and all that stuff. You know, so having outside eyes to look in and say, you know, here's exactly what we need to be doing. This other stuff, those ideas that you had, they're great, but they're kind of just like noise to defining what you actually want. 
And, uh, you know, so having outside, an outside, outside eyes in the form of a coach has been really supportive. Uh, for me as well. you, you know, Aaron, you're one of those rare individuals that uh, lives the, the things that he communicates. You, actually, you do very much. When you meet, when I met you, 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 could, you could tell. I mean, you live the way that you talk, uh, which is a bit rare. So you talk about li- like minimizing things. Does, what does that look like in terms of the space you live in? Does that mean you live in a really small place? With just kind of the stuff that you need, you only have a couple pairs of shoes, you don't have very many clothes, or does it look like something different? No, it's just looking, so walking into a room and, you know, how does that, just paying attention to how that room viscerally makes a person feel, I think is quite valuable. Uh, And then also acknowledging the reality that you become the shape of the room that you spend a lot of time in. You know, like the Jim Rohn quote, you become the, the, the product of the five people you spend the most time with. Um, you know, there's a Winston Churchill quote first, I include this in the, in, in the Align Method book. First, we, we shape our houses and then eventually they shape us. You know, so having that acknowledgement and awareness that you literally become the shape of the space that you're in. You know, and so for me, walking into my home, um, oh, the first thing you see is there's a view out into nature. So there's like a little dog park across the street and then there's a river across the street. That was very much by design. I was looking for a place where I can look out and, and be like with the nature. Uh, we can get into, you know, why that matters. And then uh, my place looks pretty normal. I have a, you know, a flat screen TV on the wall. I have a couch. There's lots of plants and books and stuff around. Uh, the difference would be, that would be kind of like define, you know, this place compared to maybe someplace else would be there's ample space to move around on the ground. So I have a comfortable rug right now as we're recording this. I'm sitting on this infrared mat. Um, I have like a you know a little myofascial ball thing here. I've got this little prickly pad, whatever sleep induction mat. I've got like self care crap all over the place. Uh, I'm sitting on a, a floor cushion. So while we're having this conversation, I'm in red a light on your bonds right now. That improves the testosterone. Yeah, That's what I read. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, so so during this conversation. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to take this time and like do some freaking, you know, yoga or FRC or, you know, whatever mobility work that we, that we'd prefer to do with our, our toes and our ankles and our knees and our hips and our lower back and our pelvic floor muscles. Yeah. I want to comment on that. Cause uh, again, he does what he says. So I know someone may be watching this and saying, Oh yeah, but does he really do that? He does. Like you come into a room and there's no cameras, no nothing. And you'll start stretching and moving on the floor um, because you take that as an opportunity. Um, now I, I'm on a chair right now and this is pretty much how I am most of the day, just sitting in this chair, probably not ideal, <laughs> but, but well, I, th- I think what you do is, uh, um, is, is a good idea, especially because we're so sedentary all day long that it keeps yeah. things healthy and moving uh, properly. And, and I don't, I have no interest in being the outlandish heretical look at me, you know, five finger toe barefoot guy butthole gazing mm. like in the middle of a, a, a mall like i don't i don't i do not care to be different Is i don't care to make a malls? make a point of this whatever <laughs> like i don't i don't <laughs> i have like no interest in in identifying with like oh i'm the guy doing something different to me i find the concept of hang if you're waiting for a bus you know or you're in an airport waiting for your plane the concept of you having access to the natural human resting position of popping a squat, like that's just normal. Yeah. You know, so it's renormalizing that. And so when someone looks and is like, oh, wow, you're like a yogi, you're like a malasana. It's like, no, this is a fucking squat. Like this is just you resting in your body. Yeah. That's a, you know, that's, when, that's a good point. It's, it's more natural and normal than, than what I'm doing, which is sitting in a chair. Yeah. Well, there's no, there's no, normal or, or, you know, natural, it's like the naturalistic fallacy just because something's natural makes it better. It's just defining what are the outcomes that you'd prefer to achieve and then reverse engineering your lifestyle and your environment and your relationships and your nutrition and everything back from that point, you know? And, and, and so if you look at, at, at cultures that, you know, so there's recently some research from university of, of Southern California, where researchers went out and spent time with Hatsa in northern Tanzania, and they um, strapped the, the Hatsa tribes people up with these mechanisms that could measure the range of motion of their hips and their knees. And they found that the, the tribesmen were going through similar 
um, amount of, uh, or they're spending similar amount of time in resting positions as industrialized cultures. The average that they came up with is 9.82 hours per day. The difference was the, the the manner that they're resting. Yeah. So they're kneeling, they're squatting, they're essentially just hanging out like any human being pre kindergarten would hang out. The way a human being pre kindergarten, pre you know the the indoctrination of the desk and sitting, and you're sick if you're not able to sit and stare into a book or into a screen all day. Concept. That's a learned thing that happens around age five, depending unless you're going to like a Waldorf school or something. Uh, before that, you'd pretty much do all this stuff. And that's what a primate would do. That's what a person in you know a more like ancestral lifestyle would do. It's very freaking normal. You know, like that's it's it's just normal. I have a question for you around that, Aaron. Um, because you know, it brings up a lot of questions actually, but one of the main ones is, you know, we're we were raised in these you know, Western industrialized societies and for better or worse, it's just different than the way our bodies evolved, uh, for most of human history. And you name some of it, right. We're, we're sitting at ch on chairs. We're sitting in front of on desks. Um, we wear shoes all the time and there's a lot of the development and plasticity of the brain and the body that occurs when, when we're young, that we lose somewhat as we get older. Like for example, you could teach a six-year-old or a seven-year-old multiple languages, and once they learn all of them, they don't have an accent in, either, either, in any of them. They speak them fluently with no accent, with the proper accent, I should say. As an adult, you learn another language. You can learn it, but you'll always have an accent in the accent of the primary language that you learned when you were a kid because that plasticity is somewhat lost. <clears throat> what, how much of an improvement can you make in your movement as an adult when you were a kid you know, and you, and you, you, you wore shoes and you sat at desks and, you know, is there a significant amount of, of, of difference you can make? And, and can you go all the way back to what your body was supposed to be able to do? Or is some of that lost permanently because you lost those, those formative, I guess, plastic years? I think the only, the only permanent loss in a, in a body and uh, would be a surgery. Like if if you have a, a metal plate in place of what used to be bone and it was still undergoing wolf's law, you know, where it's, it's going to be changing based off its environmental stimuli. Um, in that case, it's kind of, it's a different scenario. Certainly surgery. I love surgery. You know, I have lots of friends who have hit, have hip, hip surgeries and various different surgeries. I think it's like really changed their lives for the better, but that's the only variable where it's like, well, like now we're working with something different Got than it. this really highly adaptable biological system. But if you're younger, obviously your body's going to be able to change with a bit more quickness, but no, your body's continually under a state of construction 100% of the time. Oh. As we're having, as we're having this conversation, we're all going through this magical electrical process called, called mechanotransduction. And essentially your butts by being in contact with the chairs, the way that they are. And if someone's taking a walk, listening to this, perhaps they're having that contact with the feet and the various tensions that are pulling throughout you know, every muscle and all the connective tissue through your body. It's creating electrical stimuli. It's called piezoelectricity. I know you guys already know all about this. And it's sending the signal to your clast and blast cells, fibroclasts and osteoclasts, and these, these cells that chew up tissue or, or build tissue back. It's sending the signal to those cells on how to, how to grow. So 100% of the time, as long as you were a living, sentient, walking, locomoting being, your body is continually under constant development. That doesn't change. Do you have any, mm -hmm. any advice for the average person who, you know, cause, cause one of the challenges I encountered as a trainer was initially, I, there were so many things I'd want people to change, right? They'd come to me and say they want to lose weight. And I'm like, okay, here's the list of all the things that we can do to maximize your results. And I, I quickly learned, I don't want to say quickly, it actually took me years to figure out that it just didn't work for most people because it was too much. It was too much all at once. And I had to kind of really focus on small changes and things that, you know, had a large impact uh, in relationship to the time that it was taken to, to do them. And I had to learn how to become effective essentially in that sense and just accept that most people are not going to be fitness fanatics. Do you have like real practical <clears throat> advice or tips for people along these lines for the average person, not the fitness fanatic, but somebody who's, you know, they go to the gym twice a week and they want to improve their health. Like, are there like easy or, or I don't want to say easy, but simple changes that can yield a, you know, a good measurable change or response that they can do in their, in their normal lives. 
Yeah, a million percent. I mean, that's that to me. That's I, I think with working with with clients or you know the, the whole function of writing the Align Method book was to provide all of the simple, tangible um, tips and trips, tricks, and kind of like lifestyle, subtle lifestyle shifts that we can make. That it's almost like imperceptible, but they end up having massive impact. You know, and so a big part of that would be like going back to the shape of your environment. If you have a space in your home where it does naturally make sense to go through the full up and down range of motion and get up and down off the ground. Again, I feel it feels almost dumb to talk about because it should, I mean, should's a dumb word too, but it, ideally it would have just already been happening. It never would have been taken away. Right. You know, it's like suddenly a culture starts drinking a quarter of the amount of water that would be optimal for hydration. And then suddenly 80 years later, people are like, I think we need to drink a little bit more water. And it sounds like this wild idea, you know? And so when you're going up and down through that full range of motion, you know, fall risk is the number one leading reason for elderly needed assisted living. You know, how many millions or billions of dollars is invested in elderly, you know, needing support? You know, because there's a danger, there's a risk of, of falling to the ground and not being able to get back up and, you know, needing to be, be supported in that way. I mean, that's like it's just so much, you know, out, even outside of the money, like just like the sovereignty and autonomy of, of our, our grandparents and our parents and eventually ourselves, like that doesn't need to happen. So just even that in and of itself, like just like if that was the only thing that this conversation was about, I think that would be enough, you know, and then, and then from there, Going into saying, okay, another thing that's pretty relevant, especially right now, you know, would be having full functional range of motion of your rib cage and you know your your lung capacity, being able to access that vital lung capacity. Um, and if we are sitting hunching over a lot, you know, slouched over into a chair, it's not a good or bad moralistic thing. It just happens to cause those ribs to start to lose their potential to go through that full range of motion, like each rib, when you breathe, ideally it should move like the handle of a bucket. So inhalation, it's coming up, exhalation is coming down, inhalation is coming up, and it's going through this full range of motion. If we're continually stuck in one range, those intercostal muscles aren't able to, to function optimally. You know, those, those ribs are not able to go through that full range of motion. There's going to be a limitation on your ability to, to breathe. You know, and so something really simple that we could do to change that relationship would just be get our freaking hands up over our head, you know? And then from there, maybe grab a bar, grab a tree branch and just hang, you know? And so it doesn't need to be, I'm on this sweet pull-up program, you know, and I'm getting going, getting gains, you know, and I'm doing muscle ups and I'm, you know, getting famous on Instagram. It could literally just be throw a pull-up bar in between any doorway that you pass through regularly. You're changing your visual field. You're changing the shape of your environment. And then it's almost like your arms are lifted up above your head for you. Like if you walk past a pull-up bar in a doorway, seven out of 10 times, you'll probably just naturally go like, woo, you'll do a little swing through there just because it's there. You know, so you multiply that times a day, a week, a month, a year, you know, that starts to be really meaningful impact. And there, there's a, a whole book about this called Shoulder Pain by an orthopedic surgeon called Dr. John Kirsch. And he found that working, they did a specific study with us. And he found that, that there was 92 subjects in the study. All of them were potentially going to undergo surgery for shoulder impingement syndrome. And um, what he found was that 90 out of 92 were able to be completely relieved of any pain and recover full range of motion by simply going through a very basic hanging protocol daily. It was totaled out about 90 seconds in total. I go over this in the hanging chapter in the Align Method book. Uh, and then there's just a few other simple exercises, you know, all that stuff we include in there. And it's just like, it's another thing where it's like, it almost is like, oh, like, I can't believe that this is the conversation, but a lot of the most simple tools are the most effective. Yeah. And as we get yeah. overcomplicated with our approach to things, oftentimes, you know, it's just kind of confusing and we end up having lots of complex, highly nuanced debates that go nowhere. No one's arguing with it's it's a it's probably a good idea for you to get your arms up above your head every now and again. No one's arguing that, you know, unless maybe there might be some contention around this, but there's the the research that suggests that hand grip is a better indicator for cardiovascular health 
than blood pressure. You know, so I, I include that in the book as well. It's like, I don't remember the exact numbers. You can look it up, but every thing is like every seven pound increase or decrease in hand grip, it would, would increase the likelihood by some specific percentage of suffering a heart attack or some type of cardiovascular disease in your life. And it's sorry for, for messing. I don't know what this, the exact statistics are on that, but anybody can just look, look up that research study and you'll get all the details, you know, and like the, those, those basic fundamentals, they're consistent across all cultures, all languages, men, women, you know, any person. And most of us have this really just glaring, low hanging fruit sitting in front of us. And we're not taking advantage of that. And then we're going for this really, you know, complex protocols. So all I'm saying is like, first, let's clean up the low hanging fruit. That's just like in your home, in your office, in your travel. Um, And then from there, let's, you know, let's, let's do some of the more complex stuff. Now, would you say, um, you know, your, your main mission and what you've been writing about the most, you know, in your books is to kind of um, teach people how to incorporate a lot of these like primal fundamental type movements that will benefit their body the most without necessarily having to create this structured workout and programming. And are you more focused on just, you know, here's a few things that you can do to really help your body out right now as it stands in your uh, crazy lifestyle that you have going on? Yeah, I like structured workouts and programs, uh, but I, I don't care about them as much if we haven't addressed the fundamental lifestyle conditions. And the reason that I have that that perspective is because I worked with clients. My my sole work for twelve years before starting even having a social media handle or you know starting a podcast or anything like that was just working with clients to try to help them achieve their fitness goals or, you know, relieve pain goals or, you know, like the, whatever their physical goals were. And what I, I found with that was that we would have really, um, you know, we would get great results. And then that back thing or knee thing or shoulder thing that was totally gone for six days or 10 days would start to drift back. And, you know, I'd say, I'd see that pattern happening enough times, or if it's, you know, you're on like some yo-yo diet thing or some, you know, workout thing, you look jacked and tan for three months. Everyone's like, oh my God, you're amazing. And then, you know, you see that person again in another three months, and you're like, oh my God, what happened? So to me, I'm saying, what's the, what's the, the container that this plan exists in? You know, so then I kind of wound back and said like, okay, I, I'm now, I'm really interested in your container. You know, and that's like, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Bruce Lipton. He's a guy kind of like pioneered concepts around epigenetics. And he was a, a cell biologist or still is a cell biologist. And uh, what he said to me in a podcast I did with him a couple of years ago was that when he was in his lab, if they wanted to create a, a change in the cells in a Petri dish, you don't do anything to the cell. You change the culture that the cell exists within. And then the cell shifts because the, sh- the cell is an extension or a continuation of the culture that it resides in, you know? And so like culture. So I had to leave LA. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, so, so yeah, I mean, you think, you think about that. It's, it, that's like, you can, you're, we're sensitive to our environment. You know, we're sensitive to the people around. We're sensitive to, you know, if you live in a cold, like I just had a, 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 a uh, consultation call with someone in Sweden before this, and they are, you know, they're feeling kind of like low energy and like, they know the things to do, but they just don't really like have that the motivation to do it. And so we go through and like, well, how much sunlight are you getting in a day? And they're like, well, not enough. I work in cryptocurrency. I'm on my computer all day long I'm in my office. I'm on my chair. Like, I'm like, okay, well, I mean, inadequate exposure to sunlight and, and vitamin D levels, like that's associated to depression and, you know, like every di- form of dis-ease you could think of, there's going to be some relationship in there. Well, maybe not everyone, but vitamin D is important for a lot of functions in the body, you know? And so that was like the just, just blatantly obvious low-hanging fruit. I'm like, what are we even talking about if you're not getting enough sun each day? It's like, it's like, calling and saying, I have this flower and it's wilting and it just won't grow. Like, and it's in a closet and I don't understand like, why isn't it growing? It's like, well, do you take it outside at all? 
you know, and so it's just, it's just interesting to me how, how obvious, not obvious, but how many people know what to do, you know, and, and a lot of the solutions are quite simple. And if you really get under the hood of a lot of people's lifestyles, it's like, oh my God, there's, there's so much here. Yeah. I like, I don't need to add a lot. I like what you're saying about changing the environment. I I remember as a kid, uh, when I was a kid, I did judo Mm -hmm. and one of the students there is his family was from Japan. And I remember visiting them and seeing everybody sit on the floor when we ate a meal and they, and it was old, young, everybody sat on the floor real comfortably. And I remember thinking that's so uncomfortable. And I asked him about it and he's like, well, no, it's very comfortable. And I thought, oh, of course, because you do this every single day. Like this is how you yeah. sit down. And we kind of lost uh, that ability. So, yeah. so what was the, what was the main motivation for your new book and who did you write it for? Like what, what, what's the, what was the, the driving force behind your, the latest book that you're putting so- out here? So this is an expanded and revised version of a book that came out a couple of years ago. Um, so the, a, a big part of it, one, I wanted to add a more movement to the book. So in the end, we include essentially like a 40 to 45 minute um, movement sequence program that people can follow with regularity. And it essentially just goes through and gets in like all the nooks and crannies of every joint in the body in a pretty simplistic way. And then also... You know, when if you do a book, you know you write it. When you know, I wrote it three years ago, like my mind changes and personality changes and voice changes. You know, and so having the opportunity to go through and refine and make it be um, just more in my voice was a, a really amazing opportunity. That the publishers, you know, offered offered me to do. Um, and so yeah, it was it was just an opportunity to kind of go through and like refine and and, and bring it up to date to now three years later. Aaron, you you mentioned the dead hang, which I I love that. Uh, what are some other either movements or isometric positions that you love? What what are some staple movements or positions that you love to put the body in, and why? Well, I, I mean, be defining movement. I think from movement from the lens of kind of like we're talking about. I, I think that coming into um, breathing would be a form of of movement, you know, and so starting to pay attention to the way that you, way that you breathe. So two things, one from like a weightlifting perspective, starting to understand, um, your ability to create intra-abdominal pressure, bracing your spine naturally when you're picking up heavy stuff off of the ground, or even if you're doing a push up, or if you're throwing a punch or throwing a kick, you know, to be able to access Dr. Stuart McGill calls it the double pulse where if you're throwing a punch or throw a kick, you first are going to stabilize through your midline. You're going to get really tight like a stone for a second to create leverage. And then your appendage turns into a whip, comes out, and then turns a stone again upon impact and then release. And you go through that cycle. In order to do that, you need to be able to move your torso into a strong, stable, well-oriented position to create leverage for the rest of the body. Um, you know, so a great starting point for that would be uh, just paying attention to, to breathing through the nose. If you're breathing through the nose throughout the day, and I, we can talk about like specific like exercise things as well. Um, but I, when I hear like movement, you know, my mind typically goes in other directions. Um, but just paying attention to the value in getting air through the nose because lots of reasons. Um, one, it slows down the amount of air that you can take in. So you're going to take in about a third of the amount of air. So you, every time you're taking a breath with your nose, you're going to be engaging those diaphragmatic muscles. You know, and so when you're breathing as well, a movement to pay attention to is bringing your hands down the side of the ribs uh, and breathing horizontally, you could call it, or breathing outward, uh, bringing that breath into the low back. So bring your hands into your low back and pay attention to just, can you create that pressure? Can you create a little engagement or like almost like a pushing sensation in your low back? And if you can do that just when you're hanging out, then that sets you up to be able to do a deadlift or do a squat or do a push up or do anything meaningful with your body where you're creating leverage. You know, so what's like a move that I would, I would do, I would say, start paying attention to that pretty much all the time. Um, what's a, a tip that could start to help people to be able to engage that and understand like what that is, as opposed to like, just like a theoretical concept, you get a weight belt. The value of a, a, a weight belt isn't because it just stabilizes your spine. It's because it teaches your body 
how to create that intra-abdominal pressure and actually have a feedback me- mechanism to be able to push against the belt. So you create your own stabilization. You know, so I think a kind of like a static type movement or like, a, like a one thing that I think would be really helpful for a lot of people is invest in, in a little weight belt. And you just get like a Velcro one, just kind of push it so you get pressure around your midsection and start tinkering with creating that outward pressure while you are in the gym doing, you know, you could try it with a push up, try it with a squat, try it with a lunge, try it with a military press. You know, most of these movements that we're doing, if we're not stabilizing through the midsection, um, you know, Pavel Satsulin, uh, I think it's his analogy where he talks about it's like shooting a cannon out of a canoe. If you're shooting a cannon out of a canoe, you wreck your canoe. <laughs> like if you want a big old cannon, you need to first stabilize your midsection or your, or your canoe. You know, so that would be something that I would think as far as, you know, I don't know, like in dumbbell curls or something. Like I, I, I think that, that getting into the root of how do we do all of the movements, understanding how to engage with our breath efficiently is going to be ground zero. Yeah. You know, Aaron, um, oftentimes when we lose the ability to do something, I guess, properly or in an optimal way, it's because we've learned to do that thing in a different way that's more optimal based off of what we're asking our body to do. For example, if I walk in high heels all the time, then my body's going to learn how to walk well in high, in heels, but it's not going to be very good at walking without the heels. And ultimately, walking in heels is a suboptimal way to walk because humans didn't evolve necessarily walking with our heels so elevated. So the, here's the direction I'm going. We're talking about breathing, and I've heard lots of people say we don't breathe right or we breathe sub-opt- suboptimally. Like why? Why? Why have we? Why do we breathe the way that we breathe? What is that benefiting or why have we learned to breathe in ways that are not optimal for, you know, rib function, oxygen utilization, relaxation, like all the things people say? I mean, it's, there's a lot of other, like there's, there's interesting, there's the, the breathe book by James Nestor. There's shut your mouth, close your, or shut, shut your mouth, save your life um, by, uh, who is it? George Catlin, uh, oxygen advantage, Buteco method, be great places to go with this. Um, you know, there's a lot of different mewing, John Mew, like the, like those, anything in, in the, in the realm of, of, um, what is it called? Functional. I forget the other term for it, but all of those directions would be, you know, this would be great channels to go down with that. I think it can start from being a baby, you know, maybe you had like a, a, like a tongue tie would be one potential thing. And then as a child, you weren't able to naturally have your tongue rest up on the roof of the mouth. Um, and so then you're going to naturally be breathing through your mouth likely throughout the day. Like right now, people listening, if you just bring your tongue up to the roof of your mouth, then you're not going to breathe through your mouth. I just did that right now while you're saying that. That's such a simple, great tip right there. Like as you were talking, I did that. (laughs) And then it just, it forces you to go right to your nose instead of your, uh, is that part of the mewing method where they talk about also it's affected orthodontics? Exactly. Yeah. So your tongue acts as a natural retain, retainer for your upper palate or your maxilla. So when you are naturally just breathing like a human, once again, like this is just breathing like a human. This isn't some wild, crazy thing. This is just accessing the 30 odd functions that your nose, your nasal passages have specifically for respiration. And like the one that your mouth does, your mouth just allows you to get a lot of air quick. Like that's the function of your mouth if you if from a breathing perspective. But if you're over breathing, and this kind of gets into like Patrick McEwen and oxygen advantage and Buteco method, uh, if you're over breathing, your cells become less effective at releasing uh, oxygen. So your red blood cells, um, they end up, they have a higher, it's called oxygen binding affinity uh, when you have a lot of air. And so when you're breathing all the time, your cells essentially become lazy because they think that your body has access to all the air in the world. When you reduce the amount of air that your body has access to by no nasal breathing would be one thing, just slowing down your breath through your nose would be helpful as well. You know, when you're breathing, ideally, I got this from Patrick McEwen as well, who he helped revise the nose breathing chapter and Wim Hof helped with it as well. And, well, Wim Hof didn't really help. He, he read through and like gave me a thumbs up and you know, he's like, he's like, I like it. Um, but when you're breathing, ideally, it should be so soft and so smooth that you don't even feel the little hairs inside your nose moving. Like they should just be still. 
you know, and you shouldn't, if someone, if you approach someone and you can hear them heavy breathing, that's an indication that that person is sick or they're winded. If they're winded, that's fine. But if you're at rest, you're like, <sighs> like that person, you're like, oh my God, like they, they need help. I but hope they, that's but maybe not they can squat like 500 pounds though. You know what I mean? But maybe they can squat. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, exactly. BMI first. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, and so, and then, and then within, within the, so there's a lot of things. I know that the question was, how does this happen in the first place? There's a lot of potential reasons this happens in the first place. Another, another direction. Uh, because pre agrarian age and like even into, into researching into like native Americans and such um, having malocclusion or crooked teeth was pretty much a, a, like a, a non-event. And the reason for that is, is the, the, the body naturally has this retaining mechanism called your tongue that, cr- that maintains spaciousness in the mouth. And also naturally you're probably going to be eating rougher foods so when you're eating rougher foods, you're gnawing through a steak or you're, you know, you're biting on whatever it is you need to bite because you don't have a bunch of really sharp razor blades. So maybe you kind of like are, are using your mouth like a tool, kind of like you use the rest of your body like a tool. Like you pick something up off of the ground, you're essentially outsourcing your muscles to be a tool to pick something about, up off of the ground. You know, your masseter muscles and everything, like it's all fair game. You know, and so if you're actively utilizing those muscles, then those muscles respond and you're going to have a stronger jawline and you might have, you're not going to have that like receding chin. Um, I just had Steven Lynn on my podcast. He's a functional dentist and we got like really deep into the value of fat soluble vitamins, which are missing from a lot of modern people's diets, particularly AD and K3. And they have this interesting like trilogy where they, they, um, you know, affect with each other. They all pair off of each other to help with your bony development you know, and development of more things than just bones, you know? And so if you're missing some of those natural foods, such as maybe like organ meats and things of the sort, uh, where there's, they're very rich in this fat soluble vitamins that also is going to impact your bony development, you know, but the, the big, very clear, like elephant in the room is if you have crooked teeth, you know, or your mouth breathing, you know, or any of, any of that, just look at where is your tongue. And if you want to get stronger and more, you know, efficient with the way that you move that, that tongue engagement of the tongue is actually, uh, as well, going to be helpful with, um, increasing strength as, as well as, uh, jaw strength. If you're squeezing down your jaw and there's been research with this in relation to pull-ups, uh, people on average can, can get a couple more pull-ups out. You know, so if you're, when you're doing a pull-up, if you have a mouthpiece or I've seen it done where you have like a little weight around your mouth and it's like hanging down and you're like, oh, you gotta hold, hold the weight up. You actually end up, and I think what this would ultimately probably relate to would, would be one, maybe some better orientation of the cervical spine, you know, and like maybe find like neutrality in the spine. But I think a big thing is, is concept that you guys are probably familiar with called irradiation, which is like one of like Sheraton's laws. It's, it's essentially when you are contracting that by having a stronger contraction, it allows you the potential to engage more motor units throughout the whole body. So the more of your body that you use, the stronger your body will become. You know, so if you're doing a, a bench press, for example, or a squat, you know, or anything, ideally that bench press movement, which you guys know way more about this, I think like these topics than I do, I'm like more of an enthusiast, uh, but that a strong bench presser is going to be bench pressing with every freaking muscle in their body. It's by no means like a pec major, pec minor, tricep, anterior delt exercise, you know? And if it is that, you probably don't have a big bench press. And so incorporated in that would be, you know, look like tongue posture and, and jaw posture and, you know, really your whole body. Yeah, no, this is true. I, uh, uh, I remember reading about uh, Weston A. Price. He was a dentist that traveled the world and he would take pictures of these, you know, what they, what they referred to as primitive people's teeth and jaws and noticed none of them had dental care, but nobody had cavities. Nobody needed braces. Nobody needed their wisdom teeth pulled out. And they had really big straight teeth and jaws. And he all related it to their diet and showed that they they ate very little grains and lots of animal meats and proteins and tubers and vegetables. And um, they had like different shaped faces, jaws, and their, and their teeth were all extremely healthy. So yeah, yeah, I've read a lot about what you're saying and I, I, you know, it's, um, it's, quite interesting that it worked out that way. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and again, once again, it like comes back to very simplistic, almost like silly concepts. Like a lot of the things that make us really healthy. Uh, it's like, oh yeah, you mean that those things that people were like the brutes were doing, you know, the people <laughs> that we we think are like, oh, like simple minded. It's like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> they were from a, a cellular biological perspective winning. Yeah, the simpletons. That's that's true. Now, Aaron, <laughs> I got I got a good question for you because you know we're talking about kind of the challenges of modern life, and you know sure. we, we've changed our environments um, so much. And like you said, the body adapts to the environment. And especially the last couple of years, we've gone through a very kind of strange, I guess, stress-filled time for a lot of people. We see anxiety and depression uh, at record levels. Um, and I think stress, although we've always experienced stress, it's very different now, right? It's not as extreme and acute, but it's kind of this constant level of, rem- of stress that we have. We're constantly reminded to be afraid because of media and social media. And it's just, it's, it's very different. Do you have any practices for your clients around this, especially over the last couple of years? Uh, do you tell them to avoid like social media and media or have like a day where they black everything out and they're just disconnected from all that stuff? Is there anything that you've done to help people through this? Yeah. I mean, the, the irony is when we are looking into our our cell phones, which is where most people are probably consuming most of their media at this point, you are one myopically focusing, focusing your eyes in on a single point, like you would, if there was a predator outside. Uh, And when you are in that myopically focused position, which, which Andrew Huberman is someone that's, you know, he's, he's quite brilliant in this whole conversation. He also helped revise the vision chapter in my book. I'm very grateful for him for doing that. Um, you're literally, you're, you're, you're teeing your autonomic nervous system to already be in a threat response. Interesting. Which is impressive, you know? And then if you were also, if you were also to, to piggyback on that, it's like, okay, cool. Vision affects autonomic nervous system. It's continuous with our central nervous system. Uh, when you are in a relaxed visual posture, you're, you're taking in the panorama. You're, you're just spacing out. If an animal is under threat, they don't space out, right? They don't just like, ah, oh, unless maybe they're going into like a freeze mode, you know, and they're like, they're like playing dead, which is, a, you know, a whole nother level. Um, but if you're just, just having a moment, you're just like, oh, I mean, you're just kind of taking in the whole horizon and the whole panorama. You're not being chased by anything. You don't suspect there's a panther in the woods. You're just taking it all in. And so your autonomic nervous system is also tied into that to say, ah, Okay you know, mind pump crew is, is relaxing. They're chilling. You know, let's, let's start to put the body into a place where we can rest and digest and repair and go into that response. And so that's the first thing is understanding that your, your vision is a tool. It's like a toggle that you can pull on to affect your state. And then another interesting thing is postural patterns. This is obviously content, contentious territory. Uh, the whole concept of postural feedback that when you are in certain positions, they make you feel a certain way. When you're in other positions, they make you feel another way. There's like the Amy Cuddy research from Harvard, where they suggested that being in a superwoman pose can increase testosterone levels and decreased cortisol. The inverse happens when they're kind of like a hunched over, like I lost position. Um, you know, there's a lot of contention going back and forth with that. But if you look at any, you know, watch a UFC fighter come into a ring, like they're not going to come into the ring typically in a position where they're kind of like just hunched over and kind of knees are dropping in valgusly and shoulders are rolling forward and they're in kind of forward head posture and they're kind of moping in. You almost exclusively not see that, you know, and, and, and in culture, it's a similar thing. We're always conveying this information back and forth to each other, you know, and there was a a study from uh, San Francisco state university where they took uh, different groups of students. They had one group in a hunched over posture and then another group in a, in a just like an upright, kind of like a superwoman type posture. And what they found was it was easy for people in the upright posture to be able to um, remember past positive experiences in their lives. And when you go into kind of this oh, like deflated, hunched over posture, it's easier for you to access memories of sadness not a moralistic, bad or good thing. It's just different options and expressions that we have. 
you know, and so when you are in a that posture, hunching over into your phone, so says the research from San Francisco State University. I mean, there's there's like a whole bounty of different studies um, going into this theory called postural feedback. Um, you know, and so you can look into any of that. But I think really it's just like studies, they have a bias, you know, and a lot of studies that don't prove the bias just get thrown away. You know, and there was that there was that that article in the Lancet that suggested like over 50% of studies are kind of bullshit anyway. You know, so I think I think with all of this, it's like looking at it's like take the study with a grain of salt, test it within yourself, see if you notice a change. You know, and then the la- the last thing that I'll say that I think is an interesting study, and as I'm as I'm shitting on studies, um, came from uh, researchers in New York State University. I think it was in 1981. And they went into uh, a prison and they asked various different prisoners that were in there for violent crimes. They gave them, they showed them images and videos of people walking down a street and said, which of these people would you be likely to rob? Yeah. Who would, who would be, who would be prey for you? And what they found was that it wasn't about their sex. It wasn't about their size. It wasn't about their, their race. Uh, it was about their their level of uh, directionality and wholeness is the term they use for their movement. If they moved with a whole, like a, a sense of wholeness, like the parts were connected, they they they're here, they're getting to here, Confident. moving a straight line. Yeah, there's no disorganization or disorientation. It's like boof, like I'm I'm like, you know, think of like a like there's a river out here in front of me. There's like kayakers that go through there. Like if that kayak is like you know, hydrodynamic and everyone's even on each side. It's like, boo, it's cutting through the water. You don't, you don't mess with that kayak, you know, but the kayak that's kind of like, there's two rowers on this side and six on that side. And the, like the bow is kind of this way and the stern's that way. It's kind of like, you know, it's taking on some water. It's like, it's a yard sale. You can do whatever you want with that kayak, you know, and we're continually conveying these messages to each other. You know, anytime you're out in public, you know, or even with yourself, just looking in the mirror, you're like, how many people are, are rehearsing stories about themselves? And then when you get finished with a workout and you're with your bros or your girls and you're like, Rawr! like you feel the best you felt in it, you know, days to weeks to months. What's your posture in that present moment? It's not hunched over staring in the phone posture. And then we're habituated to kind of lurking back or lurching back into that, into that, that like home phone position. And, you know, I think there's enough research to suggest that it, it does impact the way that we feel and make us feel, um, you know, like there's a potential threat of losing or there's a threat that exists, you know, in, in some capacity. Uh, and then on top of that, what are the messages that we're getting through there? I think coming back to that minimalism, minimizing your visual intake of media is immensely valuable. You know, examining like every visual image that you're consuming like hopefully right now you listening to this you're conscious like yes this is net positive in my life if it's not stop <laughs> like, like take control like cut it out you know and, and and i think we are maybe excessively um generous with uh, the, the 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 visual information that we expose ourselves to because i think we don't necessarily know notice like the immediate impact but long term and i and media media as well um you know i think thinking of it as like it's this is something that i am i am this information i'm digesting i'm masticating it i'm digesting it i'm processing it you know and i'm making it kind of like a part of my system and if you're you're taking in information that's that's continually projecting you know all the things fear separation division all of that you know, I think just, you know, watch out for it. Just start paying attention. I think that's the first step with it. Yeah, I think it makes sense. I think the your your inside communicates to the outside and how it should position and move. But I think the communication is two-way. I think the outside gives information to your brain and your inside and tells you what's going on outside my body. And if you're standing in a way that would show fear or anxiety or stress, your brain's going to get the message and say, okay, we need to be prepared for those things and we need to feel that particular way. I want to ask you something a little bit more personal because I because we kind of touched on how you moved from LA to Austin. I have a lot of friends yeah. who did that recently. I have a lot of friends who left LA and moved to I have one that moved to Austin, another friend that moved to Tennessee, um, another friend that moved to Florida. 
And the they said that LA was just, it became a bit toxic for them and they had to leave the environment and they mentioned a few things. Did you find that for yourself? Did you leave because that environment just wasn't conducive to the stuff that you value or was it something else? I don't, I, I just don't like people telling me what to do. It just bothers me. Oh. So maybe that's, that might, Amen. that might, yeah. that might, that might I, be I, like, I like you a lot more now. I like you before <laughs> too, but now I like you a lot more. <laughs> yeah. You know, so that might be some, you know, there might be some psychoanalytical union, something in relation to authority or mother or father, something there, but with someone's <laughs> imposing their will on me and I don't understand the logic in the will and all of the research that I'm seeing is, is not in alignment with any kind of pragmatic understanding of, of, of this command. And it's just do this because I told you to, um, it really irks me, you know? And, and so, and so for me, I think there's probably something there for me to like kind of look at in other ways, but then also, you know, um, I just don't, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't need to be in a place that I, I get kind of, I feel defensive. You know, and Texas is pretty good about, you know, you can own as many guns as you want and you can, you know, you can go, there's, I think there's a, a, a policy or a law that says you can't actually um, demand that someone wears a mask, which I love that you wear a mask. I love that you have a vaccine. I love that you have a hundred boosters. Like I want you to just whatever you want. Like, I love that for yeah, you. Have fun with it fuck off like like, <laughs> like that's it you know and and it, and until there's there would be research that would suggest that the antibodies that i am you know i am i'm teaming with because i've had the vid twice um were to suggest that my antibodies are worse than your your vaccine um then once again mind your business you know once once we get to a point where your vaccine is absolutely, undoubtedly, uh, you know, the, the research has suggested that that you cannot transfer the disease anymore, and you can't contract the disease. Um, then maybe we have a conversation, you know. But at this point, that's that's not what the research suggests. Uh, so for me, I'm just like, just mind your business. And so I, I I'm going to place myself into a container where people are better about minding their business. Yeah. I, I'm going to take it a step further. I don't care what the research says. It, it's my choice. So, and it's, your, I, yeah. and it's your choice to not be around me if you don't want to, but it's my choice. And yeah. if I want to choose to drink alcohol and smoke cigarettes all day, I can, if I want to choose to put my life at risk, that's my choice too. It's your choice. And, to the, and the, 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 the issue comes when it's like, okay, you can smoke cigarettes, but can you blow cigarette smoke into my window? Yeah. You know, and that's when it's like, okay, well now that's fine. I won't smoke kind of a, on your property or wherever you own and you tell, and I can't, that's fine. That's, but you, yeah. you, you get my, you get my point. This has been an interesting two years for people in our space because mm -hmm. we are in the health and wellness space. And I would say predictably, probably the most pushback uh, against a lot of these laws and mandates. And and by the way, we're two years into it. And I think anybody now can look back and be like, oh yeah, there's a lot of things that were, there were a lot of overreactions and a lot of fear-based stuff. I think it's pretty clear at this point. It's not, it's not controversial anymore. But no. there was a, a rely, I, I, predictably a lot of pushback from people in our space. Uh, and I think it's because we're responsible for our own health. We've already we've been taking our own health seriously since before you even considered it when you know you were afraid or whatever. Um, so how did you handle all of that? It, it was so hard for me to look at and see what was going on and hear no talk about improving someone's health through exercise and nutrition. Although you're seeing it now because the narrative has completely fallen apart or falling apart. You saw almost none of that before. Like, how did you handle that? Did you pull your hair out or were you just like, turn it off? Let me focus on things that I can control. So I, from the beginning of March, have been on the side of, we need to be asking more questions. This doesn't completely add up. I'm not saying anything. All I'm saying is we need to ask more questions because it's, it has been, and it still is essentially like cancelable and illegal to say anything, <laughs> which that in and of itself, in and of itself is in, indicative of something, I think, um, you know, even more meaningful than any kind of viral disease, you know? And, and, and so, since the beginning, that's been my perspective is just, we need to ask questions. We need to ask questions. And if someone was just telling you to stop asking questions, it's 
probably time to ask even more questions about that person, you know, and, and, and their, you know, their, their biases and, you know, like what's, who are they working for exactly? And that's not me saying, again, not me saying anything. It's just continually to maintain that, that perspective of just, you know, if you feel curious about something or something doesn't add up, your leadership should be on the side of, oh, I, I want you to ask questions until we all understand. Like I, su- I support you uh, being curious because I think that's what makes you know, America a really amazing, special place to live in. And I never really appreciated America being an American until the last two years. And now I'm like, oh, like, yeah, like this is, that's cool. Like that's meaningful to have that freedom to think and freedom to speak you know, and, and freedom to live the way that you, you'd like, as long as you're not, you know, hurting somebody else. Um, and so from the, the health perspective, I've since day one been saying, we need to be outside with regularity. You need to open all your windows up. You know, you need to, if you have some type of infection or, or issue of something of the sort, like allowing nature and, and plants and oxygenated air um, like that's going to be to come into your your home. That's going to be one of the primary foundations and, and solutions. Uh, you need ample sunlight. You need vitamin D. You need enough movement. You need community. You need connection. You need purpose. And if you're living in a place where, um, you know, you're like I, I saw a uh, this Instagram video recently where the guy's talking about uh, an abusive relationship. Then yeah. team, I guess might might you guys see this? It might you guys might even Probably. post it, but <laughs> but it's a, it's a guy and he's talking about this this girl and his relationship with this man, and you know I'm not going to remember all of it, but he's like he doesn't let her go to work and yeah. he doesn't let her, he doesn't let her see her friends. They can only see each other each other via like Facebook or Instagram or whatever, and you know he's like he like gaslights her and like all these different different. It was it was way more eloquent and impactful um, than that. But then at the end, you're like, man, this guy sounds like a narcissistic, dangerous asshole. <laughs> like, yeah. He needs to be in jail. His name is Gavin Newsom. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, like, it's like that's literally been the, the suggested scenario for two years. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a that's amazing when you think about it. And I, again, I'm not I'm not saying anything because I don't have enough information and I don't have a meaningful enough opinion to be like, oh, this is what's happening. But if that doesn't make you ask questions, like come, like what could? Yeah, it's it's been really strange. I think it's the lizard people. That's what I'm going to say. <laughs> no, but it's been, I don't. Yeah, I don't it's know. been it, it has been uh, very strange. I will say this: you, you said you're you know about uh i guess grateful to be living here we did pretty good compared to everybody else now we didn't do you know, perfect or great but we did pretty good thankfully because we have a state system and a court system that really slows shit down so um in comparison to our other free western nat- nation you know uh friends and countries we did pretty damn good um yeah, they're, I mean, I, I, it's way, way better than uh, than most of Europe, Canada, and Australia in terms of you know what we're. Um, and let's we're hope it goes. Let's hope it. Let's hope it goes in that direction. It's it, the narrative's yeah. already falling apart. You can already see, and the, and the politicians are changing their tune because they're they're trying to get elected in, in midterms. So, but I, yeah. I want to ask you more because you're such a smart guy. Um, you're actually one of the smartest people I, I think I know, and you're pretty damn. You're really good at at um, human behavior and identifying human behavior and motivations. This has been an observation in mass fear, and I, it, it's not the first time. I mean, historically, I can go through and name several times when, when we've all gotten scared and did stuff that wasn't very rational um, because of it. But this is the first time. This is you know recent. Like, it, it, Were you sitting there kind of looking at how people were acting and observing and going, oh my gosh, like this is – this is mob mentality in some cases, and this fear is taking over, and it's addicting. It's almost like yeah. people were afraid, and they wanted to be more afraid, so they kept scaring themselves more and more. Did you sit there and, and watch all this and kind of be like, whoa, what's what's happening here? Well, it, so there's, I mean, there's, there's a bunch of things. I think this is such an, such an endlessly interesting topic that we'll probably unpack for years to come, um, but- you know, like the, the worst thing to happen to someone is nothing at all is a quote from somebody. I don't know who exactly, you know, but we, I think so many people live these, you know, what's the other quote, quiet lives of desperation. So like Henry David Thoreau. You know, so we, we, so many people are in kind of this place. It's just like, this is just boring. You know, I'm at this 
job. I'm in this cubicle. I'm getting this like junk partial spectrum light throughout the day. And then I'm getting this artificial sun in my eyeballs all night. And, you know, I'm in this kind of so-so relationship maybe, or I'm not really feeling, I feel like I'm falling short of like my potential. You know, I have this like deep seated yearning for something more, you know, and I think that when there's a culture of people that are in that, like Alan Watts calls it eating the, the menu and confusing it for the meal. I think there's so many people that are in this kind of like menu life where you're getting the superficial version of a thing, but you're not really getting like the real stuff. And I think that a culture of people that are largely baked in that way of life are kind of waiting for some, it's like a tinder box for something, you know, it's like just something to get riled up about because I'm alive, you know, and if I feel out of control in my life, the, the, you know, the, the, the tendency will be to impose my control upon someone lower than me on the socioeconomic hierarchy, typically, or just in this case, now suddenly policy makes it so that anybody that's not doing the thing that, that you do, they are now lower on like the moralistic hierarchy. And now you can impose your, 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 you know, opinion what and an your authority on them. You know, and so that's whenever someone is kind of like a cunt to me about something in relation to masks or whatever it may be, I typically, not always, sometimes my tendency is to kind of like nudge the beehive and be more aggravating, which is not, you know, mature. The Justin approach. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's my go-to. <laughs> you know, but. Shake the tree. But, yeah, shake it up. You know, and that's, I know it's not the right decision, but, um, you know, the, the other, the other side of that is if you want to be like the bigger person, you know, is to come from a place of, of acknowledging, accepting that if you lived, if you were born by the same parents at the same time, ate the same food, you know, hung out with the same people in the same city and suddenly, uh, you know, arrived at this point, like you would be that person. You know, so that person isn't that person. That person is a product of their environmental conditions and their parents and every type of environmental you know, stimuli that they've bumped into throughout their life. So they're not that person. So you can't be mad at that person. You know, and, and so you can be understanding of the culture that they've been bred from. And then from there, you can have some compassion for like, huh, interesting. Like you've arrived to this point, you know, and it really irritates me, you know, but. Uh, if I came from where you came from, I, you know, I would think the same. Yeah. This and so that's, that's been like the challenge for me throughout this is to actually um, have compassion for the people that I find really annoying. Yeah, no, that's a very interesting take. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I agree for the most part. I mean, I, I forgot who said this it might've been Jordan Peterson who says, you know, if you, if you look at, at history and saw what the Nazis did and how the Germans behaved and you think that you, if you went back in time, you would be Schindler you probably wouldn't. You'd probably be one of the people that stood by and let things happen because that's just... That's what the majority did. That's just the majority and that's just human nature. And then, you know, to what you're saying about living a kind of a boring life, you know, it's funny, I read a statistic and there was a, there was a part of the statistic that was very strange. So m most of it, most of these statistics I'm about to say were very predictable. And then there was one part that was really weird, but then it made sense later on. So the average American... I just talked about this on a podcast. I'd love your opinion on this, right? The average American gained over throughout the pandemic over 40 pounds. Okay. So it's this huge weight gain over the course of the pandemic. The, the highest weight gain group were millennials. Okay. Millennials and then the, the generation under them gained the most amount of weight. People over 65 gained the least amount of weight. And at first you're like, that's kind of weird. Like they're older, they're less active, lower metabolic rate. Like what's going on? You would think that they gain more weight. Maybe they got sick and we're thinking about this. And then I thought about my grandfather. So I have a grandfather, he's 91 years old and nothing scares this man. I, I remember I, I talked to him about everything. I'm like, no, you know, this one, everything was first going down. We don't know what's going on. We don't know much about COVID, you know, in the very beginning, it, understandably, we're like, let's figure this out, right? So he had to stay at home and we'd bring him groceries and that was it. And he's like, this is stupid. I don't care, whatever. And I'm like, no, no, you, you, you can't do this. You got to stay at home. We got to make sure we keep you safe. He goes, I don't give a shit about this. And I said, well, I don't understand why you're not scared. He goes, you kidding me? He goes, I was 13 years old, standing on the top of trains, getting to the next town to try to make money for my family. I lived through the Great Depression. My, you know, my, I lived at the remnants of, you know, after the World War, had gone through Sicily and ravaged it. Like, he goes, I'm not scared of this. And I thought, well, I guess that makes sense. 
if you live your whole life, you know, like kind of perfect and nothing ever happens to you, you're very easily afraid. But if you're my grandfather, like it's going to take like Godzilla for him to be like, all right, let's get out of town type of deal. So yeah. I think what you're saying is, uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't think of it that way, but now it makes, it all makes kind of perfect well, sense. I think, you know, I got this from Andy Galpin and Laird Hamilton was where I first heard this idea of, of like modern people are just too darn precious. You know, we're so precious with our diets and you got to be perfectly ketotic and like, oh my God, I had, you know, a, a half bite of a simple sugar, you know, you know, suddenly my blood sugar is spiking and I'm, I have to go take a 45 minute nap and I need to go take some bio-optimizers, you know, <laughs> blood sugar stabilizing pills. And it's like, okay, cool. And I'm going to take a walk outside and kind of recollect. I'm going to meditate and get some crystals and like, oh, call my therapist. I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> you know? I was like that, you know, that's a thing, you know, being able to come to a point and, and having, because we live in a culture where we've largely outsourced most, at least mechanical stress it, to technology, we need to elect to engage with that stress in the form of cold plunges or going for a yeah. hike or, you know, exercising, li lifting weights and, you know, growing, adding these hermetic stressors into our lives because, We've done such an impeccable job at at um, divorcing ourselves from those, yeah. which is you know so cool. Aaron, Aaron, let me use it. Let me use an analogy that just came to me. You know, yeah. autoimmune. The, we know some stuff about autoimmune diseases, and autoimmune diseases have just exploded uh, in modern times. And one of the things that we've connected to autoimmune issues is that it's like the immune system when it when it doesn't have to deal with a lot of insults, it starts to find things to attack. So you'll find like children who grow up on farms or on animals. Uh, they have far less autoimmune issues. There's also, there's also studies that show that someone with like Crohn's disease, if you give them like a parasite, all of a sudden Crohn's disease, the, the symptoms drop down considerably. So it's almost like our fear mechanisms, if you think of it like the immune system, and it's had nothing to really be afraid against. And so it's looking for things to be stressed out over. And when we finally give it something that's got a little bit of validity, it just, it just went crazy like an autoimmune issue. Like we just go, we, we just freak out and we go nuts. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, I don't, I, I've asked this question to a lot of people that do have like great depth in that conversation. And, and I don't, I don't feel like I have enough authority or a meaningful enough of opinion to suggest like autoimmune conditions are a, a, a process or some relation to like self-hate or self-destruction. Mm. And intuitively I'm like, well, <laughs> but but in relation to the the elderly thing that, that, that there is actually some interesting data on and like the perspective of elderly is uh back pain statistically tends to diminish with people after age uh 60 oh, weird which is interesting hmm. you know and antidepressant medication from my understanding last i read is is the highest among, I think it's like late 30, early 40, uh, white women. Yeah. And, and in, often antidepressants will reduce or eliminate back pain for people who don't have anatomical or anything that you can identify in an MRI, you give them an antidepressant right. back pain goes away. Right. Right. And then there's like, you know, endless research of, you know, to that suggesting that specific musculoskeletal postural patterns are not one-to-one -one relationships for inciting pain. You know, so if you have a, some shoulder thing or forward head posture or discogenic thing or knee meniscus, whatever, you know, flat feet, you know, which flat feet art is you know, probably as, as bad as people make them out to be it. But, you know, if you have these patterns that a lot of kinesio people be like, aha, like that's the thing. Most, most research has suggested that there's, there's not a clear connection of postural patterns creating pain. Um, you know, obviously I think there is like a, there is a mechanistic wear and tear if you're using ineffective, inefficient movement patterns and kind of like grinding your joints. Eventually that's going to probably lead to some type of inflammation and something, you know, but pain is really complex. You know, we, Super we, complex. we, 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 the, like the broader, we, you know, and I've, this has been the question, one of the primary questions that I've had literally for the last, like at least a decade, you know, at least like seven years during my podcast, I ask people, what is pain a lot? Like anytime I think someone has an interesting lens on it, I, like that's one of the questions on the podcast is like, what is pain? You know, and, and, and most people don't know exactly what the stuff is, but it seems like there is some level of, there's general tendencies, you know, there's consistencies, but one of them 
you know, is there's a, there's a psychosomatic component to it. And this is what, what, you know, healing back pain, Dr. John, what, what is his name? John, what's the healing back pain? I don't know. Name? I don't know. Oh shoot. What's his name? Anyways, he calls it TMS tension myositis syndrome. And what he suggests is that if you have some type of, um, I'll remember his name before the end of this, but if you have some type of, of, um, repressed anger or anxiety or some fear or something, you think of the times in your life that maybe you wanted to like cry or you wanted to yell, but it wasn't socially appropriate to do so in that moment. You have this physical expression of like, ah, you know, if you're crying, you might feel like your diaphragm contracting. You might feel less like this, like, you know, weight in your throat, not appropriate to, to do it. So it's almost like you literally like swallow it down in a way, and then you just kind of collect yourself and, and move on. Like that doesn't really happen in, in, in nature, you know, in, in, for the most part in nature, you know, you can get it into like Robert Sapolsky's work, why zebras don't get ulcers. You can get a Peter Levine's work, uh, waking the tiger within, uh, Bessel van der Kalk gets into this body keeps a score. Yeah. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to back you up here because first off the, uh, Doug just pulled it up as Dr. Do uh, John Sarno. Yeah, Dr. Okay. Sarno, thank Sarno. you. Um, I'm going to back yeah. you up because someone may be listening and thinking, oh, this sounds like whatever. Well, first off, there's what causes the pain. There's the pain itself, which is, by the way, if you ever talk to a doctor that deals with, I'm talking Western medicine doctor that deals with pain, they will tell you it's one of the most difficult jobs in the world because it's so hard to define pain and what kind of pain it is and to treat and we don't you know it's very very challenging there's but there's also the relationship to the pain yeah, perception that, your tolerance yeah like i mean you yep. know like like when i would train yeah, a new client variants. and we would do an exercise they would and they never worked out before the pain would be almost intolerable now i feel just as much if not more pain than they do when i work out the difference is i have a different relationship to the pain when i'm doing exercise i'm embracing and enjoying it because it's part of the process and you learn that and you change your 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 relationship to that. So very complex, but I'm going to back you up. Yeah. There was a study, uh, and I believe there's been a couple studies like this, where they actually took people, this is true, with knee pain, and they went in, cut, oh, this was a study, they cut open, so everybody went in, left knee pain, right knee pain, whatever. They cut the knee open. Half the people, they actually did a, uh, a surgical procedure. The other half, they just closed the knee back up. So they just cut it, closed the back up, did nothing. They could not find a difference between the pain relief between the group that had this procedure and the group that had that did not have the procedure. They thought they had a procedure and they had the same amount of pain relief as the group that actually had the procedure. So very yeah, strange. That was, yeah, that was done in Finland. They were doing meniscotomies with, with people and they were following them for, for a year and even beyond that. And it was pretty much about... 50 50 like people were some people got better some people didn't get better in both sides where you got the mock surgery or, or the or the so the weird surgery so weird. well you know yeah. i mean a, a lot of the the, the the pain that we might experience or or the pain relief that we may experience one the one thing so one of the things i feel like if i just stop the conversation that postural patterns and mechanics don't always associate to pain and then we stop talking that's not the end of the conversation movement consistently across the board is shown to be very helpful with relief of pain. Yes. You know, and, and so it's, it's, if you are a person that is just say someone has forward head posture or they have a scoliosis or they have, you know, whatever the, whatever the thing is, you know, the anterior or an, anterior pelvis, or they have a valgus knee or whatever, you're not going to be able to just look at that body and say, aha, you have pain in this place. In fact, oftentimes it's the complete opposite. So if someone has a lot of tension, say their, their hips hiked up or they have a lot of tension on the SI on the right side, oftentimes there's going to be some sensation of pain on the left. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting. Uh, but movement pretty much across the board is shown to be supportive. So that's not saying, okay, we're all screwed. It's just this emotional daddy issue thing that's somewhere in my liver. Not that at all. Moving your body, working out, exercising, whatever form makes you feel good for the most part is going to be supportive. And then within that, let's build the body from a mechanically efficient, productive way and understand these foundational principles on how to move well. Yes. And then once I, once I understand that, then I can overlay those principles into almost any medium of movement practice. Yes. I can go to a CrossFit and be safe. I can go to a yoga, yoga studio and be safe. I can dance and be safe. I can run. Running is so darn complex. I mean, running is, running is a, a movement practice. It is a, like... With people just suddenly it's 
2022, you, your butt jiggles too much, you know, and you want to lose 20 pounds and you've been sitting on your butt kind of hunching over to this position and, and limiting range of motion in your ankles and your, you know, your, your knees are weak because they haven't gone beyond the point of your toes for the last ever. Cause that's the, you know, the education that you learned is really bad. Your hip flexors are tight. Like everything's like locked down and you're and like, you go for cool, run. run in a marathon yeah. Yeah. and go run to fatigue. Yeah. Terrible idea. Terrible. Absolutely terrible. You know, and then from a hormonal perspective as well. You yeah. know, so, so learning, I'll, I'll shut up because I know there's probably other stuff you want to say, but learning how, so cool. If I, if I want to run, what do I do? I mean, get a coach would be a great, great, great thing. But uh, learning how to sprint would be very effective. You know, so starting to work more like interval-based training instead of just doing that gradual kind of death march for five miles and coming back and you know, having this hormonal dump and, you know, your, your, your joints are on fire and, you know, that, 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 the, that part, it's like, it seems like low hanging fruit, but there's more nuance to running than what most of us, most of us, I think, you know, might think. Totally. And I Absolutely. want to back you up even more on the movement thing. Yes. Movement does affect our physical body and correct movement patterns on stuff, but mo- you cannot separate it from how it affects us emotionally and mentally and correct. psychologically. So, so although pain is very complex. One of the reasons why movement is so effective at working through pain is is not just because of the physical, mechanical aspects, but it's also the emotional and psychological the associations with it. Aspects. So that's why it's so damn effective. And across the board, movement is more consistently effective when it comes to pain than pain medicine or or surgeries, uh, especially in the long term. And it's because it does all those things. So it's not just. So I know you were defending it for a second, but it, it affects everything. There, it, you cannot separate the emotional, mental, psychological, and the physical with movement. It's all one, and all of it works together. Speaking of which, um, we predicted that this year, people in the health and fitness and wellness space would see a surge of a, a renewed interest, a surge of clients and interests like we haven't seen in a long time. And we predicted this because, well, probably because gyms were closed for a while. People were afraid. People are kind of slowly losing the fear. Everybody's feeling like crap. And they're like, I got to go exercise. I need to move. I need to work with someone to make myself feel better. Are you seeing this as well on your end? Are you seeing this kind of renewed interest in this just kind of this new surge of people interested in wanting to improve their health and fitness? Yes. And I'm seeing both. I'm seeing one, you know, if you create a too big of a distance between you and the thing that you want, sometimes it can seem impossible to achieve. Sure. You know, so I think, yes, for people that have been getting outside and have been getting some movement in each day and getting some sunlight in each day and paying attention to the food that they put in their face and paying attention to maintaining relationships and kind of like, there's kind of keeping that baseline. I think those people oftentimes have even greater motivation than everybody else, you know, paradoxically, you know, and, and, so within that, there's if we get deeper into that hole, kind of like the, I was talking to the person I was doing the call with today in Sweden, where he's kind of in this like seems like this like backup, you know, like almost like a hole that it feels like it might feel impossible to get out of. That's you know that's an interesting spot, you know. And so with the people in that in that position, I think offering really like small little steps just to get the engine turning enough that we can kind of get the alternator going and get the body, you know, back up and running. But yeah, so I, I have, I think probably received more interest than is common, but I've also seen a lot of um, like helplessness yeah. type sensation. Yeah. All right, Aaron, where can people find this, this book that your new book um, and where can people find you? Cause I think again, you're so valuable. So I'd, I'd like people to check, check out your stuff. Thanks. Yeah. I really appreciate it. I feel the exact same way about, uh, about you guys. Um, the, book. I mean, ideally you walk, you know, Barnes and Noble or Target or someplace of the sort. I mean, it's in any, any bookstore. It's called the Align Method. Um, and I have the, I have the book here, the Laird Hamilton on the cover here, something I think people say like, what's the book about? He said, it's the foundational principles for unlocking peak human potential. You know, so that's really the, the intention of creating the book was providing the foundational principles that we need from you know a mechanical lens, how to move the body, but then also looking, adjusting our lens on fitness into it's not a thing that we do, but it's every aspect of our lives 
we're, you know, we're, 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 we are fitness, you know? And so that was the intention of writing the book was getting into, you know, how we live day to day. So, you know, Amazon, people might get it there. You know, if people are interested in going to the, the podcast world, I'd recommend they can go back and listen to my episode with you guys. They listen to one with Bruce Lipton, be a fine place. Um, but yeah, books, books anywhere books are sold. It's called the Align Method. Excellent. Thank awesome. you again. Thanks, right Aaron. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Aaron. Great conversation. Yeah, thank you guys. I appreciate Enjoy you. Enjoy that freedom out there. Yeah. Good, yeah. <laughs> Sweet yeah. freedom. Yeah. <laughs> good, good catching up with you, bro. All right. We'll, yeah. we'll talk to you later, man. 